Good evening. On behalf of Sutter Health, welcome to Sutter Santa Rosa Regional Hospital's online session about joint pain. But tonight, uh, we'll, you'll learn more about the causes of joint pain and some of the latest treatment options from mm -hmm. Dr. Michael McDermott. I think you'll really love his presentation, his bedside manner as a doctor, and the way he answers questions. Now, due to the coronavirus, we've pivoted our regular in-person seminar to this online webinar format. So just a couple matters of quick business on how an online webinar works. When you have a question for the doctor, just scroll your mouse, touchpad or pointer over the Q&A button, click ask a question and then type it in. Uh, Dr. McDermott will get to most of your questions at the end. Once the webinar is over, you'll still have a chance to ask more questions, contact a doctor, or request an appointment. A survey form will pop up in your browser when this is done, and just in case it doesn't, we'll also send you the form by email tomorrow. So let's get started. Tonight, we're lucky to have Dr. McDermott presenting. He is a board-certified orthopedic specialist who's performed hundreds of knee surgeries, hip surgeries. He's a specialist in sports medicine, minimally invasive procedures, and he has treated countless of others with non-surgical options. Mike was a former commander in the Navy, a flight surgeon in the Persian Gulf, and he did his orthopedic residency in San Diego. He's one of a few Northern California orthopedists trained in robotic assisted surgery. But most importantly, his patients have the best outcomes and they live pain free. So with that, we're proud to welcome Dr. McDermott. So what are the major causes of joint, of joint pain? Well, today's a talk on, on knee replacement and hip replacement. The, uh, our, the, the most, there are, there are many causes, a lot can be, uh, simple meniscus tears, uh, and those usually are associated with mechanical type symptoms that either can be repaired or, or need arthroscopy for debridement purposes. But ultimately, it usually sort of gets the, the ball rolling for progressive conditions that lead to arthritis, uh, as, as seen on this slide. The, the causes of, of osteoarthritis are not totally understood. We know some things about it. They, it can be affected by genetics and age and medical history, and I'll go into detail on that in a second. Um, beginning with osteoarthritis, this is also known as degenerative joint disease, and it, it is the most common form of arthritis uh, affecting 14% of adults and uh, you know, up to almost 30 million Americans. Um, the arthritis is, is the covering of the bone. It's a lubricating type of a surface. Um, I, I kind of use the analogy with my patients of it's sort of like skating in an ice arena and it's nice and there's, not, there's very little flick, friction and you can glide very nicely. But if, you tr if that ice were melted and you tried to skate on the wood below, then that becomes a problem. So the the, then the ends of the bone will rub together and the, the joint will actually still function for a period of time. Sometimes for an amazing period of time, some people just don't have pain uh, and, and they only come in because their knee is now bent at an angle and it's unstable. Uh, other people begin to feel pain when they, even before they have any exposed bone within the joint. But it is a protective coating. It's a cushion type of a thing and shock absorber. Um, anything that breaks down that barrier, then it sort of starts the process of, of arthritis and wear and tear in the knee. It can also just start from, from an aging process. Uh, and it is progressive. And usually it, it reaches a point where it starts to really impact people's function to where then they come in because they're having pain and something needs to be done. Then there are other types that are more systemic, uh, autoimmune, where the body starts to sort of attack itself, so to speak, and break its own cartilage down for reasons unknown. And this is more like a rheumatoid arthritis type of a picture. Uh, it doesn't, it's not just limited to the hips and knees, but it'll attack the small joints as well. 
Um, and then there's post-traumatic, and this is a case of fractures where, where there's been enough energy imparted by virtue of an accident where the bone fractures. This also disru disrupts the cartilage uh, in a number of ways. The, the, the amount of force that was enough to break the bone will also bruise the cartilage, and then there's, it, it will kill some of the cells in that cartilage, weakening it and starting the similar process of wear and tear. Uh, and then it, or it could at the fracture line or other places, it can also delaminate the cartilage. And once that gets peeled away from the bone, then it, there's really no way to get that to stick back down. And again, that will propagate as well. Uh, okay, we can go to the next slide. So non-surgical options. We start with diet and exercise and start from the, the simplest and, and then we'll work up. The formula that I think comes up in a later slide as well, but I, I always discuss with my patients is that every pound of weight somebody carries will translate to five pounds of contact pressure in a knee. So if somebody, so obviously the more weight you carry, the more contact pressure you're gonna have on your knee. And it's sort of similar to if, if myself and Sean were to buy pickup trucks on the same day and I drove mine to the office and back and he drove his out to a job site loaded with maybe a thousand pounds of gear whose tires are going to wear out faster. So, so it does increase the wear and tear to the point where if somebody were to lose 20 pounds, they could actually reduce the contact stress in their knee by as much as a hundred pounds. Um, so this is where diet and exercise come in. When we talk about exercise, we usually emphasize that low impact is far better than impact because the impact also has the effect on cartilage. Uh, but, but the knee does like the motion and it actually produces lubrication, which is good. Uh, there are holistic measures, the acupuncture being one. I am a believer in acupuncture. I, I had a 13 year old dog who uh, could not put any weight on his, his left hind leg. And we took him to UC Davis twice and they couldn't figure it out. And uh, a friend of mine who's an ER doc told me that his wife was a vet who used acupuncture and that we should see what he could do for him. And she came out and he had no idea why he had a needle in his forehead for calming. But lo and behold, Within about 30 minutes after she left, he would be up walking around as though there was nothing wrong with his leg. And he, we did that about every three months for another two years before he died of natural causes. So I don't see any room for placebo effect there. And I have a lot of people that use this uh, and, and also feel that it's very effective. And it's the insurance companies also believe so because most of them will authorize it. Um, massage, release techniques, uh, strengthening that will also be can also be very helpful and then we have medications to include supplements which we'll go into momentarily as well as injections so as we talked about uh, the weight management and, and good health are good uh, here we have the the formula of one equals five and uh, when it comes to diet we you always hear them, us talking about Remove the carbohydrates. They, they also tend to be some of the, the tastiest foods. Um, but reduce the carbohydrates as well as the sugar and then focus on whole grains, fruits, vegetables. Uh, the, there's a number of diet plans out there. There's protein shake diets. I've tried those myself. They were very effective, but they're also high in sugar. And at one point you need to come off of those. Um, I had another friend who had a carried a tremendous amount of weight. And then I saw her at one point and she was very skinny and asked her how to do it. And she said, Weight Watchers. And I gave that a try, um, which I still use. The, the, I think it's a better philosophy not to, to market for them, but it, it then teaches you which foods carry a lot of points and which foods don't. And, and so I found out that I can eat fruits all day long and it's no points at all and 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 i'm not hungry throughout the day um as well as grains and nuts and vegetables well i'd say grains and vegetables nuts uh could be a different story but but so whatever works for you is fine uh but i think it's important to understand uh, what you're eating 
rather than just rely on like a protein shake. Um, once you get your arthritis, reaching that normal BMI is not necessarily going to stop the process, but it will certainly slow it down. Uh, it can relieve your pain for, for months, years, but ultimately just like the tire on your car, you can start driving your car uh, a lot easier than, than you were in the past, but at one point the tire will still wear out. So activity in motion, prolonged standing or walking, prolonged standing tends to be a little bit worse because you're standing in one place. Again, the knee isn't moving. You begin to experience stiffness. This can be the same thing with prolonged sitting, driving in cars, people coming from North County or further away. The, the knee will become stiff and then it, you got to start moving it around afterward to loosen it up again. Uh, walking will do the same thing and, and in your ambulatory tolerance slowly starts to decrease more and more to where people will say that they can't walk for more than five minutes, 10 minutes without having to sit down and rest. Stairs become a problem because for, for well, for one thing, because they're more strenuous in order to go upstairs as well as downstairs, your, your quadricep muscle and the muscles in your, throughout your lower extremity have to fire and, and contract more strongly to prevent your knee from giving way or to push off in order to get you up the stairs. And this creates more contact stress on the cartilage within the knee. Same thing with lifting heavy objects. This goes back to the one pound equals five. Whether it's your body weight or whether it's a 20 pound or 30 pound or 50 pound box that you're carrying, multiply that by five. And that's the increased contact stress on that cartilage. Uh, sports, exercise, uh, again, this is going to be where we get into the non-impact versus high impact that are more than likely going to be more symptomatic and also cause the need to wear out at a faster rate. So uh, walking is good, it, it, the, but if it gets to the point where you can't walk, then an exercise bicycle or an elliptical trainer um, or a Peloton, as long as you're not trying to compete with the, the other person on the screen that can lubricate the joint and you can control the amount of resistance on your, on your legs, those tend to be effective. Uh, pickleball is very, very popular right now. And uh, that's also not bad, but the, the, in my experience, the retired community tends to get very, very competitive with this. And so there's a lot of stopping and starting and changing direction. Uh, so you, you kind of have to find out what your knee will tolerate. And usually it will tell you that maybe an hour or so after you've finished your match. And, and then you have to sort of gauge how badly the knee flares up. And, and then I tell people use a 50% rule. If it's pretty bad and it's keeping you up at night, then think about how much activity it took to get there and then cut that in half, duration, frequency, intensity, and start back at that level next time. Limit your, your match to where it's maybe half of what it was when you had that flare up and then see how it responds to that and figure out what your knee will take. Then you can start gradually progressing and ultimately you'll find a, a, you'll find a place that the knee can tolerate and likes. So holistic medicine, uh, supplements, fish oil, uh, glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, uh, there is unproven benefit. This is true. There was a study done with glucosamine years ago. I think it was done in Europe. And uh, they just put people on glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. And then they did x-rays. I don't remember whether it was, I think it was every three months or every six months where they were weight bearing x-rays of the knee and they, they measured the amount of joint space narrowing or the progression of joint space narrowing. One group took a placebo and the other took the glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate. And they were able to determine that the rate of joint space narrowing, which would re represent the rate of cartilage wear or deterioration was actually slower in the glucosamine group. It didn't, say anything about how effective it was for pain control, but there are a lot of people that swear by it. Most doctors these days are recommending the triple products. I, uh, the most effective is the glucosamine with chondroitin sulfate and MSM. And uh, 
we can write that down later or, but they are available at most health food stores and uh, as well as Costco, um, not to, uh, to push for Costco, but uh, they usually have crates of it and it's less expensive there. Uh, we talked about acupuncture, massage and, and meditation. So I think we'll move on from that. The uh, medications, these are over the counter preparations, Tylenol, they come in, you can buy the, the extra strength 500 milligram tablets, use that three times a day. Um, you can go up on that. You wanna stay under three grams a day. Uh, same with Aleve, one to two tablets, they, or, or, or Advil. Advil is a 200 milligram tablet. If you take two tablets, it's the same as a 400 milligram Motrin. If you go up to four tablets, that's an 800 milligram Motrin. So I usually will recommend patients to use three tablets, start three times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. And you can go up to four times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and bedtime. But if you're getting into these, and the same thing with the lead, this is basically naproxen. So if you, most of these preparations are half the prescription dose. An Aleve is 220 milligrams, where a naproxen tablet is 500. Usually the naproxen dose is 500 twice a day. So we tell them people with Aleve, you can do up to two tablets twice a day. These are, these are safe doses, they're low doses. You should take these with food so they don't irritate your stomach. And if you're going to be on these for a protracted period of time, it's, it's best that you inform your primary care provider that you're on them. Uh, we use them for short periods of time uh, or finite periods of time. If you're going to be on them longer, in most cases, that's okay too. But your primary care doctor needs to know so that they can uh, make sure that they order labs and address that during your yearly physical to make sure they're not having any negative effect on your kidneys or your liver. Um, we already talked about the glucosamine. These are pretty good size tablets. Uh, some people say they have difficulty swallowing them. So they also make a preparation called joint juice where you can drink it, which to me initially sounded pretty disgusting, but the, a number of my patients have come back and told me it's actually the best tasting stuff in their refrigerator. Um, turmeric is one capsule daily, also over the counter. And then there's the probiotics and omega-3s, which are also good. Stretching, this is good as you as arthritis progresses. Again, stiffness is one of the symptoms. So if you stretch daily, maintain your joint movement, the, the, this will preserve your motion as much as possible. Uh, you won't get back what you've lost. And, and in most cases, it can be progressive. But it usually stems from people not wanting to go to the limits of motion because that's where they experience the pain. And if you're not stretching that capsule out or taking it to the limits of motion, then eventually it'll contract and your motion will, will uh, decrease. This occurs a lot in arthritis where a lot of the patients that come in for surgery are not able to achieve extension and we have to correct for that at the time of surgery. Um, we talked about aerobic exercise, swimming, biking. When biking, you've, you still have to be careful uh, on hills. So if you're having to go up and down hills where you have to get up on those pedals and really push, that may be something you also have to find out what your knee can and can't tolerate. But definitely improves your cardiovascular fitness. And again, it gets into that weight control issue. This is something you might be able to control a little bit more on an exercise bike, but it sure is nice to be able to get out and, and, and breathe the fresh air, which we don't have right now. Uh, so indoors would be better. Um, avoid the weight bearing activities. If you can walk without pain, do it. It is good to get out. Strengthening exercises, again, weight and resistance training is good. This also helps to slow the progression of arthritis as long as you're limiting the impact. It, 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 it also does strengthen the bone as well. Anytime somebody has been <clears throat> bedridden for a period of time uh, or astronauts in space, they, they start to develop osteoporosis. The bone needs that stimulation to maintain its strength. Same thing with the muscles. The, the, and, the, and as we said earlier, the, the muscles crossing the joint are actually what's supporting and protecting the joints. So uh, they, they do work like shock absorbers from the standpoint of allowing your, your knee to, you don't just take the full force of the impact on your knee, it'll allow the knee to bend and the muscles can absorb some of that. Uh, injections. 
Short-term treatment it, it, for a chronic problem. This is a, it, this is a good way of putting it. Um, injections can be effective for a short period of time or they can be effective for a long period of time. Um, cortisone injections, uh, they can help relieve swelling. They can also help relieve pain. Uh, cortisone is something that has gotten kind of a bad reputation. People say, well, I don't want cortisone. I heard that's not good for you. And, and that can be true. But in most cases, cortisone is, becomes, it's helpful if it's used judiciously. It becomes harmful if it's, if it's used too long or relied upon too long and uh, not used responsibly. The, I give the analogy of like in, players in the NFL are probably receiving cortisone injections on the plane home every Sunday so they can show up to practice on Tuesday. And if you do that long enough, eventually it will weaken the cartilage. It will also weaken the capsule and, and the ligaments and, and the collagen and the tissues around the knee. Um, and, and usually by the end of their careers, their knees are pretty shot, despite the fact that they're still relatively young. But it's also not a, a drug to fear if it's being used responsibly. It can be very, very effective. Uh, we usually combine it with some lidocaine or numbing medication in order to give the cortisone more volume to spread throughout the knee. This immediately gives you uh, a numbing effect, the same as if you went to the dentist, but it will also wear off in a few hours. That can be very useful though, in terms of giving us diagnostic information in terms of how much of your pain is coming from inside the joint versus maybe from outside the joint based on the response to that injection. Uh, we will usually, they say you don't want to do more than say three a year. The it, it, it's and, and I'm not in disagreement with this. The it, it kind of gets to a point where it's either working or it isn't. And and if you're getting short-term relief from this, then it's time to move on to something else. There's also evidence that ultimately, no matter what we do, the knee will still become painful eventually and the knee will still continue to wear out to where surgery becomes the option and that's usually joint replacement and at that point there is evidence to show that there is a, a, a relation from the standpoint of how many cortisones you had before surgery which can increase the risk of getting an infection after your joint replacement so for that reason we want to limit the number of injections too we, we shouldn't be getting up into I, i've had patients come in asking for cortisone they've been to three different doctors already because eventually the other doctors cut them off and they've had up to 25 injections and when one doctor wouldn't do anymore they moved on to someone else and and for those people then i usually won't do them again either because it's not the way to do it and it can lead to bigger problems you can move on to the visco supplement injections these are the rooster comb shots or the synvisc or orthovisc or visco three these are uh, hyaluronic acid, that's a substrate of cartilage. Cartilage is made up of a structure that looks like a bottle brush. Sorry, and the, I'm having and the, the, the wire of the bottle brush is the hyaluronic acid and the bristles on the bottle brush are glucosamine with chondroitin sulfate side chains. We're not actually replacing this and building your cartilage back up, but it does seem to have the ability to take the cartilage that you have left and make it more durable. And, and, and it, at the same time, also reduce inflammation in the knee. The effects of this can last anywhere from not at all to, to perhaps six months to a year on average. Um, I actually had two patients that came in about two weeks apart. Uh, I looked at the patient's chart and they were here for a follow-up following their orthovisc injections and I hadn't seen them in four years. I asked them when their pain had come back and I was told two weeks ago. That is definitely the exception of the rule. I never thought I'd see that again. And two weeks later, somebody came in with the exact same story. Medicare will still allow these. Most other insurance companies will no longer pay for them. They have taken the, the position that this only prolongs the inevitable and therefore are not cost effective. They do run about $275 for a series of three injections. If the patient buys the syringes, they, they will oftentimes pay to have them injected. So that's also an option. 
But again, usually this would be something I'd recommend more strongly in a younger patient where we're trying to delay their knee replacement as long as possible so that we can keep that knee in their, 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 that artificial knee in their knee longer in the long run. Platelet-rich plasma and stem cells, the, this is the, the latest and greatest, all the rage. These can also uh, be a benefit. The, there's, the data is improving on these, but there still needs to be more. Uh, again, some insurance companies will cover this, others don't. PRP injections can range anywhere from $800 to $1,500 an injection and stem cells can be anywhere from $2,000 an injection on up. And they come with no guarantee. Um, they don't really have as much of an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, they, they, and, but they do seem to, to improve pain in cases. Uh, there's, there's some talk that, that they might stimulate healing the, if, you, if you can microfracture a knee uh, and, and f blood will fill in from the marrow and, and fill that deficit and form fibrocartilage that this can sometimes strengthen that. But again, it is uh, still somewhat experimental. So a lot of times it's gonna, be, it's gonna have to be out of pocket. Again, something maybe to use when you wanna be more aggressive with a younger patient. So when all conservative management fails, then, then we kind of take the next step up the ladder into surgical options. Again, start at the bottom of the, of the table and work your way up. Their arthroscopy, for a long time, the teaching was, well, take them to the operating room and, and scope them and just flush out the evil humors, clean out the debris, and they'll feel better for a while. And, and some did and some didn't. Things are a little bit more scientific these days. Uh, it, there's very few patients that have significant arthritis in their knee that don't have a meniscus tear as well. You, you simply can't rub sandpaper uh, against uh, a smooth surface and not cause that surface to roughen or start to fray or tear. The, there was a study that was ultimately done to disprove the theory that, that just washing it out is helpful, where they actually took patients to the operating room for arthroscopy when they had arthritis and, and, and degenerative meniscal tears. Half the patients, they, they made incisions on all the patients. Half the patients actually had instruments put in their knee and surgery was done. And the other patients had no instruments inserted into their knee and they, everybody sat back and read the paper for about 45 minutes and then put sutures in, put dressings on and sent them to the recovery room. So patients had no idea whether they'd had the surgery or not. The net result of that study was that the only patients that really seemed to benefit from it were the patients that were actually having mechanical symptoms. Those patients whose meniscal tears were, had unstable flap tears that were flipping and causing over on themselves so it was no longer a smooth surface and putting abnormal stress on the cartilage or producing painful catching sensations. Any types of mechanical of, of uh, sensations like that or events, by going in and debriding those meniscus so there was no longer any unstable portions, those patients seem to benefit, particularly if they actually had a fair amount of cartilage remaining and weren't down to bone. Otherwise, the removal of even the degenerative meniscus tear removed some cushion and shock absorption and actually increased the stress on the, on the arthritic knee, which actually increased the pain. So it's really not used in treatment for arthritis only if you're having painful mechanical meniscal pathology. Cartilage restoration, uh, it, it's seen here as experimental. This actually has been around for 20, 25 years in, in one form or another. I do do a fair amount of this and have for some time. The, uh, there, there, there's a number of different techniques, the, from the simplest being where if you have a contained lesion or a pothole, so to speak, where the surround of, surrounding cartilage is still good, but there is an area which is down to bone or close, which is a hot spot. So when somebody hits that, it causes pain. Uh, you, can, you can clean the edges and the margins so you have nice vertical walls. And then we spoke about microfracture earlier where you drill holes in the bone. That 
creates a pathway into the marrow so that can then flow out into that defect and fill it in with a blood patch. And over time, that will transition into fibrocartilage. It's not as good as hyaline cartilage, which is what we actually have in our knees. Why that's the reparative mechanism, we don't know, but it's not as strong and usually not as enduring, uh, but at times it can be effective in relieving pain. Uh, the, if that isn't effective, you can do, you can, you can drill that area out to a particular size, eight millimeters, 10 millimeters, usually to a depth of 10 millimeters. And then you can harvest a cylinder of cartilage from a portion of the knee that really doesn't use it. And it's not in contact with the, with an, with the other side. And you can core that out down to the depth of 10 millimeters and then tap that into place and fill the defect. You can either do that with somebody's bone. If you get into bigger lesions, you wouldn't want to do that with a lesion that's a centimeter in circumference or, or in diameter or more. You, in those cases, you can take bone from a cadaver, usually, unfortunately, a young person uh, where they still have healthy cartilage and, and you can use donor tissue in order to do that. Uh, other methods include chondrocyte implantation. This is a, a situation where, or, or a technique where you, when you're scoping the knee, you take a few pieces of cartilage, a couple of tic-tac size pieces of cartilage out, and then those get sent to a lab and they culture those and they'll actually grow your cartilage. This has been available for years. Uh, it used to be, it would come back in a fluid and, uh, and then we would have to take the covering of the bone or the periosteum and, and sew that over the defect after we cleaned up the margins and inject those cells underneath. It was very tedious uh, and time consuming to take very, very fine suture like thread and, and try to pass that through cartilage and keep that, that periosteal tissue right at the level of the cartilage so it didn't sink into the defect itself. Uh, and then it required an extensive period of non-weight bearing, so you didn't tear that off before the cartilage had to grow. These cells are now impregnated on a membrane, which can actually, and we also have uh, some cutting devices that can actually create exactly the same either rectangle or circle or oval uh, that, we, that we chose to remove the bad cartilage and then cut that exact same piece out from the membrane and then glue that in place with with a, a fibrin type glue. Um, I just did two of these last week. And in, in many cases, again, younger patients, the rest of their cartilage is in pretty good shape and we wanna make this last as long as possible. This can really be restorative. Uh, they will experiment that you can go back to running and, and, and full activities after this procedure. And I don't know that I strongly encourage that, but if, if that's how somebody measures quality of life and they're feeling better, then so be it. Uh, it the flip side to that is that you, if you know that you already have something that is no longer anatomic and probably not, doesn't have the same kind of endurance as normal cartilage, then maybe you want to stay more to that low impact theory. Uh, but those procedures are available. Um, when those procedures fail or, or don't, when they're, they're no longer, they're, they're not working any longer, maybe they fail or they just weren't an option for you. Uh, in the first place, then we have to turn to things like joint replacement. Uh, that can be a knee replacement or hip replacement, uh, depending upon where you're having your pain and your arthritis. Uh, the, and we'll get into later the different forms of, of knee replacement and hip replacement. This is where you start getting into situations where your quality of life is really affected. Your people can't sleep. It's waking them up all night. They're having stiffness. They, they have to really stop and take a few steps before they can start walking. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, maybe there's the arthritis is a greater on one side of the knee than the other, the inside versus the outside. And the knee is either bow-legged or, or you're becoming very knock-kneed. And for that re reason, the ligaments are no longer producing uh, anatomic stability and people are seeing uh, they're having problems with giving way. All conservative management, we've been ongoing with this maybe for, for a couple of years already or more, and it's no longer effective, then, then you have to consider an alternative. And that usually is some type of arthroplasty or replacement. The good news is, is this, 
works very, very well. Um, it has a tremendous track record. Uh, as you can see from the slide, there's probably more than a half a million hip replacements. In 2016, there were more than a half a million hip replacements performed. That, that number is even greater. Now, we're probably up to over a million knee replacements performed annually. And if you ask patients unsolicited after about six months to a year how they like their knee, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to 95% of people will say the same thing without being prompted, and that is, why did I wait so long? The answer to that is because you really need to get to the point where you can't take it any longer so that the, the differential between how bad it felt and how good it feels afterward is something you appreciate because it's a fairly big surgery and, and there, there is a fair amount of effort that the patient has to put into from the standpoint of rehabilitation. They want, you want them to feel as though it was worth it. So again, when is the right time? When you've tried all conservative management and this is no longer effective. That doesn't mean it's going to, everybody's going to have to go through years of conservative management. It really depends on the patient's age and the extent of the arthritis before they started having symptoms. Not everybody gets mild symptoms from the beginning and it develops into severe symptoms later. Sometimes it's a light switch. I see people walking around and the only, they're coming into clinic and the only reason they came in was because their knee was becoming more and more bow-legged and they swear that they don't have any pain. So, that gets into a situation where if you let them go much longer, they could erode away enough bone that, that you no longer have enough bone stock in order to put in a standard knee replacement and have to start using revision components that don't have the same kind of longevity. So that's one where we may pull the trigger earlier. Uh, we always get x-rays in an orthopedic office. This will verify and, and also quantify and in many cases qualify the extent of the arthritis. Uh, you're, you're having pain with activities of daily living and you can't sleep and, and nothing else is effective, then it's time to, to move in the surgical direction. The, usually this is a process that once we decide to do the knee replacement, uh, the patients usually have been in to where you've known them for a while. Uh, we get to that point, we, will, we want you to become educated. We will refer you to the preoperative classes they will prepare you the, for what do you do before your surgery? What can you expect during the surgery? And, and what can you expect while you're in the hospital as well as what can you expect afterward? What's your recovery gonna be like? They'll help you with planning, preparation. How much help do you need? What does that help represent? What's available through your insurance? What's available through your family? So, so a lot of this is all, all these questions are answered for you uh, through these joint classes. They're very, very effective. Uh, the surgery itself takes about one to three hours. Uh, the, and usually, the, you know, here the slide says one to three hospital day stays. The, when I first started out, people were staying in the hospital for as much as two weeks. And, and it, it, you look back on that now and say, why? Uh, Anesthesia really has a lot to do with this, and, and so does patient expectation and education. I think that, that just as more and more people, as you educate them more and they talk to more and more friends and say, yeah, I went home the next day and I did fine. We are using combined anesthesia these days where people will usually get a spinal on top of either a general anesthetic or possibly even conscious sedation. We use nerve blocks in, in the adductor canal to the saphenous nerve in the upper leg, which will give you long-term pain relief for sometimes 24, well, usually 24 hours and sometimes more, uh, in addition to uh, oral medications. Uh, I think go ahead to the next one, Sean. The, uh, so here's the spinal, it's recommended. Uh, they do not put narcotics in the spinal. That, that usually cuts down on the amount of nausea uh, the saphenous nerve block we already talked about, wound infiltration at the time of surgery. The, the surgeon will also put a, a combination of, uh, of local anesthetics in the posterior capsule where we can do that safely without getting the needle into the, the nerve or the blood vessels back there, which are quite big. Um, and we, we really don't use the PCAs anymore, the little buttons that the patients could push and we limit the number of narcotics. It's been shown that those actually 
slow the patient's recovery, make you more dependent upon the, on the anesthesia, and they're not as effective. Patients are really amazed. If you, can, if you can have somebody come out of surgery and not have pain and be on the pain, top of the pain curve from the very beginning, uh, the overwhelming majority of patients were, are able to go home the following day and are very happy to do so. Expiril um, was a preparation that was uh, out for a period of time. They were, they were putting bupivacaine into white blood cells. And then as the white blood cells would lyse, the, the, it would release quantities of the bupivacaine. And really, the, it, it would release it slowly over two to three days. But the technique for infusing this was, was very difficult and somewhat undefined. If you use too small of a needle, if you pushed in too much of a dose or too quickly or aggressively, that you would lyse the blood cells and, and, and it wouldn't work to where most people these days have abandoned this. There are still some people that use it. I don't, uh, the, and, and I think most of, most of us at, at Sutter that are doing joints there don't. The other forms of anesthesia are just so effective, it, it's just not necessary, but you may hear about it, so that's what it's all about. Again, limiting the narcotics, it, it it's, reduces your nausea. These are all the problems that people were having after surgery where you had to get their nausea under control. So you're giving somebody the pain medications that's causing the nausea and then trying to control it with another drug. Uh, the confusion, equilibrium issues, when you're really trying to get them out of bed and these are just keeping people bedridden. And then it would also lead to urinary retention, which would also slow people's ability to go home. Uh, early mobilization is very important. I tell people that strengthening is important too, but we can always get the strength. It's important to get that knee moving early. You don't want that knee to scar down. You just had a big surgery. And if you get the knee moving, then the, the sides of the knee will glide over the knee itself and, and form a nice film, just like the knee had before the arthritis came into play. If you don't move the knee, it will scar down. It usually scars down in those gutters and oftentimes up in the quadricep and patellar region to where oftentimes, not often fortunately, but at times patients will have to be taken back to the operating room, usually around six weeks, put them to sleep and push on the knee to break up the scar tissue uh, in order to get them moving before it, it permanently impacts their motion. Uh, so early motion is very good. And, and, and getting people home early and into their environment is, is really becoming the thing. Many of these cases these days can even be done in surgery centers where it's mandated that they be out in 23 hours. Uh, how big is the incision? Well, just big enough. It, it's not a contest. It's not who makes the smallest incision. Uh, can it be too small? Yeah, it sure can. If you're having to really pull on those tissues and with retractors, that can damage the tissue. That can lead to wound healing problems when you're trying to sew that bruised tissue back together and then the skin breaks down, which then opens it up for infection, which will work its way down into the knee and can lead to an infection of your prosthesis, which, which becomes something that you'd wish never happened. Uh, you need to be able to see all the important structures. You need to know, to be able to see what you're cutting, what you're doing, and you also need to be able to uh, make sure that it will allow proper use of your instrumentation so that all your cuts are accurate. So when all is said and done, the most important thing is, again, not necessarily how long the surgery took, how big the, insert, the incision was, but how well did the knee come out at the end of the procedure? So how well will it function for the patient and how, well will, how long will it last? Uh, too big an incision, well, it, it yeah, it, it can be ugly, but it also, it's that much more tissue that will need time to heal, and that can also negatively impact uh, somebody's rehabilitation. So we want, our ultimate goal is no pain and good function. Probably the most important step is, as, we, as I sort of touched on, you want the need to be, the components to fit well and be placed so that it's properly balanced that you have the there's four ligaments in the knee the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments are the ones in the center in most cases those come out there are some knees that will spare the posterior cruciate ligament and only re remove the anterior cruciate ligament 
uh, but the majority of knees are, are being performed where both ligaments come out. The medial and lateral structures, the, the, the inside and outside ligaments, those need to stay in and those are necessary for stability of the knee. When we say that we want the knee balanced, we want to be able to bring the knee out into full extension and have no opening when we, when we try to move it from side to side. And we want that same effect when the knee is at 90 degrees of flexion. So it's balanced. There will be a little bit of play in mid flexion and that's also normal. We want that as well. So the key is in, 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 in good surgery and, and good instrumentation and good preoperative planning will allow us to get that knee balanced so that it's stable and, and functional for the patient. Here's an example of the knee surgery. We'll go through some several slides here. You can see partial knee resurfacing on the left and then total knee replacement on the right. The partial knee replacement uh, is an option. This is for patients that the, the, the textbook answer or the board answer is, if you're considering partial knee replacement, you should have absolutely no damage cartilage in the patellofemoral joint and no damage cartilage uh, within the, whether it's the medial or lateral, depending upon which part you're pl we're replacing. Out of three compartments, two compartments should be pristine and the arthritis is only affecting one compartment. Uh, when these initially came out, they had a higher failure rate to where they actually came back off the market for a while. And, and lately, it, more recently, uh, they were re-released as instrumentation was designed and, and modifications of the implants were made uh, such that they, they do have better longevity. The, uh, I think these are an excellent choice in patients that are, again, younger patients, and we want to buy them more time. Uh, and when the rest of the knee ultimately wears out, that can be easily converted to a total knee replacement without losing bone stock and having to use revision components. You can still, in most cases, use standard knee components, which have greater longevity. Uh, if there's any additional damage, you replace the entire knee, and, and this has a tremendous track record. So there's, there, there's the example of it. Go back one. Oh, okay, go forward. I thought we missed one. So types of surgery. Once you've determined that we, we are going to do a total knee replacement, uh, you, there are robotic options. This is a, a Mako robot, uh, a company by Stryker, who makes this. They do have options for knee and hip replacement. Uh, this is performed. It's not so much a robot like you'll see in some of the general surgery procedures where the surgeon is sitting behind plexiglass and actually uh, manipulating a robot that's actually doing the surgery that has multiple spider arms. This is more of a, we call it a robotic arm. Patients receive CT scans before their surgery so that you can get a more accurate mapping of their knee and that data can be can be sent to the computer uh, that controls the robotic arm. And, and then you still have to balance the knee in the operating room. It's a situation of garbage in, garbage out. If you don't tension the knee properly in extension, mid flexion, and full flexion, and, and give accurate information to the computer, then it's going to tell you to make your cuts in the wrong places. But the arm will only allow you to make, and then you also have the ability to put on the, on the screen, you can then, it'll put up colored lines that, that replicate the shape and size of the components so you can get your size completely accurate. And you can also determine your rotation uh, and, and positioning to get the, the optimal balance. And at that point, then you, the robotic arm will only make your cuts where you selected them, that you want them, and then you put your components in place. So it can, uh, allow for very precise bone removal and placement of implants. I don't know so much about the smaller incision. The, the implants are the same size and you still have to be able to dislocate the patella out of the way. So, um, and then you also have to have enough soft tissue envelope exposed so you can map. Um, and and I, I also don't know that it really gives people a quicker recovery. I, I think a lot of that really depends upon the, the skill of the surgeon, whether he's using the robot or standard instrumentation. And the same, I think, is true for pain. Hip replacement, uh, again, 
preoperative classes. Uh, we, we prepare prior to surgery and, and talk about the role of physical therapy as well as recovery. Uh, and that a lot of times has to do with the entire family and making sure that people have adequate support following surgery. Again, about one to three hours. And, and I would say, you know, again, it's usually an overnight stay in the hospital. I think most hip replacements uh, usually are ready to go before knee replacements. They, they have less pain and the components are press fit components. And once they're in place, they're stable and you can just, you just get up and walk on it. It's the same is true for the knee. Uh, the first hip re replacement was performed uh, in the 1940s. Uh, and they've come a long way since that time. We, we still do use some cemented implants. Those were the initial uh, prostheses. Uh, but this had, the technology for hip replacements has improved tremendously. Uh, the, the, the longevity of, of knee replacements and hip replacements usually has to do with the plastic or polyethylene liner. And the, the, to get scientific for a second, it was the cross-linking of the polyethylene or the plastic as well as doing this in an oxygen-free environment that has actually uh, made tremendous achievements and advances in terms of the lack of erosion and wear and tear uh, on these implants to where these days, you know, we, people can get 30 years out of these. So again, I, I touched on this already. It, it tends to be an easier replacement. You sort of get up and walk on it and, and you don't need as much physical therapy because the range of motion just comes back quicker. And that's most of what we're correcting. In knee replacements, you're going right through the extensor mechanism. So there's pain, not only with range of motion, and the quad also takes a hit. So, so it, it requires more strengthening to get that back. It, there's less uh, interference with, with anatomical structures with hip replacement and people bounce back quicker. Uh, spinal anesthesia is usually utilized and, and we do not use blocks, primarily because you're doing it higher than where the block would be placed and it wouldn't be effective. We have anterior, we have posterior approaches. Um, the, the anterior approach is touted as being a, a new procedure. The, the procedure may be new, the approach is not. The approach has been around for a long time, but the uh, um, it is a muscle sparing approach, whereas if you go posterior, you do split the fibers of the, of the gluteus um, and, and those simply come back together. And then you do release the short external rotators. Um, and those usually are sewn back in place. And, and even those that aren't will tend to reattach or regrow and, and, and they don't compromise function. Um, there sometimes can be more pain associated with the posterior approach, but it also depends on surgeon skill and, and the degree of difficulty with how the anterior approach went. Some anterior approach patients can actually have more pain as well. Uh, there is a fairly steep learning curve with the anterior approach, so make sure you go to a surgeon that's done a, a, a large number of them. Uh, you, can, you can get fractures with either approach, but it's it's more common with the anterior approach and far less common with the posterior approach. And it's also difficult to extend the incision to fix that fracture. If you were to get a fracture with the anterior approach or with the posterior approach, you just extend your incision. So I think what, rather than focusing so much on, on some of the things that we just discussed, the main thing you want to do, I think what's more important is find a surgeon that you trust that has a good track record and a good reputation and if he does posterior approach, don't ask him to do the anterior approach. Let him do what he does. If he does anterior approach, then do the anterior approach. And if you are dead set on one approach versus the other, I'm more than happy to recommend, I do posterior approach. And I'm more than happy to recommend anterior approach surgeons that I know are skilled and will do a good job. So um, the posterior approach, you're on your, you are on your side. The, the anterior approach, you are on your back. Uh, and the, they're, you're, they are done under fluoroscopic uh, guidance. The, they say that you can more accurately place your implants, but a good hip surgeon that's done, that's done hips for a long time can, can get their implants in, a, in an anatomic position uh, based on the anatom anatomical landmarks as well. Um, so, you know, do your research on this one, folks, and, and, and uh, 
kind of decide for yourself or come talk to an orthopedic surgeon and get their thoughts on it or talk to an anterior as well as a posterior surgeon and, and see which one sounds right for you. Um, this is a slide that, that shows arthritis. You can see the one on the right. You can see a good joint space in there. There's no bone spurs. There's the, the underlying bone. It doesn't look all clouded. It doesn't look like it has pockets or holes in it. Once joints become arthritic, they start to the cloud-like appearance is the underlying bone becoming sclerotic, trying to strengthen it so it doesn't collapse because then you also have cyst formation and that just looks painful. So you take the ball out and then you, you uh, replace it with a metal stem and ball and you put a cup in there and reduce it and, and people are very happy the minute they get up and walk on it. So, you know, again, how long do these last? Again, it's, it's a combination of factors, patient age, a younger person oftentimes is going to want to do more with it. Their hips feeling good. I've had people actually try to run on them and they usually find out pretty quickly that that's not a good idea, but you can play tennis. Um, if you're, but obviously if you're not playing tennis or, or putting harder demands on your hip and you're an older person that's just using it for walking or gardening, it's probably going to last longer. Um, so the, and the patient weight, again, gets into that kind of one equals five formula. And, and obviously, it, it's sort of like, you know, the two trucks, one loaded down and not the other. One's going to wear, the tires are going to wear out faster. Um, again, avoidance of impact loading, just because now you have an interface, whether it's a knee or a hip, which is bone, which is no longer soft cartilage with, on cartilage, which has cushion, but it's now... A, a solid firm plastic insert on metal. There is no cushion. People with knee replacements, you'll hear them clicking. That's normal. And people get used to that after a while. I have had patients that try to run on these. Uh, and, and again, they find out quickly that that just doesn't work. You'll get pain, you'll get swelling. And oftentimes it'll actually lead to early loosening of the joint and necessitating revision. Uh, so same thing with jumping. It's just that whole impact, non-impact thing. Length of stays. You know, the, the, when you look at these numbers on the graph on the left, it's pretty much two days across the board. And these are, these are somewhat old numbers. Uh, most people are going home the next day. Uh, so, and then you can see the joint replacement volume. There's far more knee replacements out there than there are hip. And that's because the, Knee is less well protected. It relies more on the ligaments and the meniscal structures. It's injured far more often in sports. And then once the meniscal structures are injured, you just kind of start the clock in terms of how long it's going to be before you'll need your knee replacement. So we see a greater number of knees than hips. Uh, so why choose Santa Rosa Regional Hospital? There's two very good hospitals in the area that do joint replacement between, uh, well, Three, Hillsburg, I think, does a good job, too. And uh, um, I divide my joints between Sutter and Memorial, uh, with a greater number of mine being performed at Sutter. They both have total joint programs. Uh, I, I think that Sutter has a tremendous program. The, the, it, it starts from the preoperative education. There's very well-coordinated care. It, it does, it is comprehensive care that includes the patient as well as family education. Uh, we are using the latest techniques and we tailor those to the patient. I don't use robotic surgery in every case. I use it more often in partial knee replacement and in some selected uh, total knee cases, but I, I do use uh, standard instrumentation uh, for routine knees because I think it is very accurate instrumentation where I, I think at times I can uh, dial that knee and get it in balance with uh, more accurate information sometimes than the robot if I didn't tension it properly and put bad information into the computer. So um, the pain management is phenomenal. It's a, it's a combined effort uh, between the surgeons, the operating staff, the physical therapists, as well as the anesthesia staff, everybody works together as a team. We know each other. We know our movements. Um, so, and then the, the floor. Sutter does a tremendous job. Uh, and I'm saying this really in an unbiased tone. Uh, the, each person has a, has a private room. There is only one bed in each room. There is a large recliner chair in each room. 
Um, every morning I come in the day after surgery, I never see my patients in bed. They're at six o'clock in the morning, they're usually already up and sitting in the recliner chair having breakfast. I do believe that Sutter has educated their nurses to the point where they get it. It's not a matter of, can we just give our patients more pain medication? And if they're laying in bed quietly, then we have more time for charting and things like that. It's the physical therapists are coming in either in the morning or the afternoon or both and getting people up and getting you moving. We're mobilizing it. That was all talked about earlier. Um, it's a very dedicated staff. It's a consistent staff. You're not seeing a different person every time you come in uh, as practitioners. And, and, and again, it's more cohesive and that always leads to good results. They also track the outcomes and we use that information to, to affect change and, and improve what we're doing. Okay. Um, All right. So I think we're ready for some questions and I'm going to unshare the, uh, the screen so people can see you up close. And um, here we go. Um, the first question we have is for, um, is about how do you feel about hydro hydronic acid injections? Okay. So that is the, uh, the visco supplement injection that we touched on earlier. And um, how I feel about it is I'm, I'm actually kind of wish that they didn't stop paying for it. I, I, because I think that it was a very effective tool in certain patients that I wish we still had available to us. Um, it's, it's nice that we can still use it in Medicare patients. And I do have some patients that do choose to pay for it. Uh, and as I said earlier, the insurance companies will uh, usually pay for the injection as long as you pay for the medication. It's not for everybody. There are certain times where, I mean, if you're already in your late 60s or 70s and the joint is genuinely worn out, it, 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 I agree with the insurance companies. It's like, what's the point? It, 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 is it really cost effective? Is it just delaying the inevitable? And the answer is yes. And, and the results of the surgery are, are usually so tremendous that you know, people will look back on it and go, why did I mess around with all that other stuff when I could have had this? Because this is great, you know. But there really are certain patients where we want to get them going longer. Or maybe it's just not the right time for patients. They have family issues and things going on where maybe they're a caregiver and they just, they just can't be encumbered with a knee replacement right now. And it is something that can buy them time. So good thing to have a conversation with your surgeon about and, and kind of consider your own personal situation. And sometimes we can even pull strings with that information to get the insurance companies to authorize them for special circumstances. Great. Our uh, next question um, is, any ideas for an adductor that has never just healed for years? I have an injury going for a, with, injured going for a tennis ball, tender from near the knee all the way into the groin. I've had PT and still a problem. Any recommendations? Okay, that's a little bit more of a difficult question to answer without really taking a, a, a thorough history and, and, and having the ability to examine it and then maybe get appropriate studies such as MRIs and stuff. If your question is, is a knee replacement the answer for that, uh, it may not be if you're still having problems with a muscle tear. The question is, is where is the pain really coming from? Um, it, it, sometimes the the problem can be at the muscle attachment uh, or it can be at the musculotendinous junction, which is mostly the case. And just replacing the knee itself may not be the answer. But if you're, the arthritis in your knee is causing your knee to be in an alignment that is putting unnecessary stress or, or abnormal stress on that adductor that may be preventing it from keeling and thereby balancing out the knee and stabilizing it may actually improve. The, the adductor healing, but it's something that would really need a little bit more uh, history and inspection and physical examination to be able to fully answer that. Thank you, Dr. McDermott. And I just also want to remind people that they can still ask questions by scrolling their mouse over and clicking on the Q&A button and typing in their questions. We do have a bunch of questions, so let's go. Um, next question is, why do you not recommend ibuprofen? Well, I didn't say I don't recommend it. The, the, I'm just saying that you have to use it judiciously. 
Number one, you need to make sure there's no contraindications to using it. I think you lump ibuprofen and naproxen uh, in, in the, the same categories or, or Aleve, uh, the naproxen sodium. The, all of these are non steroidal anti-inflammatories. They are metabolized in the kidney. So if somebody already has ongoing uh, compromised kidney function or decreased kidney function, or they have a history of ulcers or, or stomach bleeds or gastric bleeding, um, it may not be the right thing for them because it actually aggravate those situations. Um, and they, again, there's a big difference between short-term use of medications and long-term use of medications that, that uh, if ibuprofen is working, that's great, but you really do need to uh, monitor patients at their yearly physical for whether or not there's any silent uh, uh, compromise or, or damage that's being done, which can sometimes be brought out on laboratory studies, um, or, or if you're you know, of age where you're getting routine colonoscopies or upper endoscopies, you may see you know, irritation or damage or bleeding that's, that's going on. Um, so it just has to be tracked and, and it's like anything else, it's at a point where if you're just going up on the dosage, then there's probably something else that needs to be done. Maybe it's another drug, maybe it's, maybe it's using, you know, start using glucosamine if you're not already or, or put using the injections. And, and so it's everything in the bag of tricks and kind of using it all until that's no longer effective. But uh, I don't think I ever said that, I, that I'm against it. I actually use it a lot in my practice. Thank you. Next question is, how can I tell the difference between sciatica in your hip or buttocks and actual hip joint pain? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, sometimes they can, they can present themselves very closely. The hip pain most of the time will present itself as pain in the anterior groin, so in the front of your hip. Whereas sciatica is usually a posterior problem and in the back. Uh, sciatica, uh, people can get something called sacroiliitis where, where the pelvis attaches to the sacrum, the sacroiliac joint uh, can be a little bit out, we say, to where it, it's, it has to be kind of reduced back in that. And that can produce uh, pain in the posterior aspect of the hip that can mimic, mimic uh, hip pain. Uh, sciatica will also oftentimes produce pain that shoots down the leg into the posterior aspect of the leg and go down to the ankle or the foot and, and hip pain will usually not do that. Uh, so if there's any question, and then, and then also if you have sciatica, it may limit your hip range of motion, but if it does, it's because of pain, whereas uh, hip arthritis can limit range of motion from pain, but when it gets very advanced, it actually will limit it just because it mechanically will obstruct it. And you can tell that because it just won't go any farther. And if you try to force it, it really hurts. So um, if you're having pain that's what you think is sciatic or whether it's hip and, and it's not responding to over-the-counter remedies, then, then the best thing to do is just come in and be evaluated. And then the other thing that we'll do is after taking a history and deciding whether we think it's based on what you're telling us, whether it's more hip or, or back, then we'll also obtain appropriate x-rays and usually you'll see the pathology. Thank you. The next question is, I have osteopenia. Uh, would my bones be strong enough for a knee replacement? In most cases, yes. Um, it, it, it's, uh, if, it was, if it was really bad, if you were uh, you know, a rheumatoid or depending upon certain medications that you've been on, uh, you may need a, uh, a, a bone density study so we can see just how osteopenic you are. Um, it's not a contraindication to doing surgery, but it may be a situation where we use revision components that have longer stems on them so that it incorporates more bone in the, in the stability process so that uh, you're not overstressing the soft bone, which can cause the implant to fail or collapse. Thank you. Next question is, does congenital hip dysplasia cause arthritis in the hip? And would it cause the need for a hip replacement later in life, like around 67 years old? Uh, yes and yes. And, and uh, sometimes uh, even earlier, even sooner, depending upon the, the extent of the dysplasia. So 
Um, we see that a lot. It can produce uh, a tremendous amount of arthritis to where sometimes the, uh, the surgery for the dysplastic hip can even be more difficult than some of the primary osteoarthritis hips. Right. There's usually there's also a distortion of the anatomy, and, and, uh, but that all gets corrected at the time of surgery. So it's not a reason not to do it, and those patients are usually pretty, pretty happy. I think you may have addressed this one, but we'll ask it anyway. How many times can I have a cortisone injection if they seem to keep me comfortable for three months or more? Is there a limit to this therapy? Yeah, and, and the answer, again, is there really is a limit. Um, fortunately, what happens is the, the, the honeymoon period tends to shorten as you've had more and more injections. They just become less and less effective. But... You know, if you start, again, we talked about that. There, there's no hard number on how many, but the more injections you've had before surgery increases the risk of developing an infection afterward, which is something that you will wish never happened. Um, and you're, again, prolonging the inevitable. Uh, and, and, and the when you get to the point where you need a hip replacement, usually the results of the hip replacement far exceed the results of the injection. So... You kind of have to weigh that out patient to patient. Um, but, you know, I've, I've turned away patients that have come in and told me they've already had 25 injections in each knee, and I'm saying that's too much. It's enough. All right. Next question. Uh, with coronavirus, are you doing surgeries now? And if I have surgery, how sure can I be that I won't catch coronavirus in the hospital? Uh, the answer is yes. We did discontinue surgery when coronavirus first came out and it was limited to uh, trauma or urgent pa urgent cases and semi-urgent cases only. So we did do some cases in the surgery center. Somebody had a meniscus that was a big tear that was flipped and their knee was locked. You can't ask that person to go five or six weeks and, and not have surgery when they can't even straighten their knee. Um, so we did elective, we did semi-urgent elective surgery and and but we did stop knee replacement for i think it was about four or five weeks and then as we started finding out more about the the disease and and whether it was going to spread more rapidly than it did were we going to have enough beds available in the hospital because knee and hip replacement do require overnight stays in most cases um then we started opening it up and we we did so with selected cases to where we started with the younger patients, those that were less susceptible to the virus first uh, and to see how things were going to go. And we have been doing it now since I believe the middle of April and uh, or toward or maybe the end of April. And uh, to my knowledge, I don't know a single patient that's contacted COVID because of it. Um, there are most of the data that we have on this comes out of New York. It was the initial data that came when they were having all these patients on ventilators and seeing a lot of deaths and, and, and trying to decide what effect did it have in terms of who came off ventilators and who didn't. And uh, what we do know is, yes, there is, there is coronavirus in Sonoma County. And yes, there are COVID-19 patients in every one of the hospitals here whether it's Memorial, Sutter, Healdsburg, Kaiser. Um, and yes, there are some patients in the ICU. Those patients are all in isolation. None of them are on the same floor that the patients will be after knee replacement or hip replacement surgery or any non-COVID patient. Um, and, and again, it's one of those things where this has done more to convince patients that they don't need to be in the hospital two or three days after surgery than anything that we've been able to preach for years because we tell them, look, you don't need to be here any longer than necessary. And they're more than ready to go home the next day and coming back saying, man, that was great. You know? And, and uh, so the, we try to do these surgeries with local anesthesia, like in regional anesthesia, spinals and, and adductor canal blocks and, and posterior capsular blocks. Um, and, and usually conscious sedation, the, if general anesthesia is used, it can be done by mask uh, or even through something called an LMA, like a diaphragm. There, again, there's some data, but it's limited, so we, it doesn't really have a lot of power, but that anybody that's been intubated 
is considered to be more at risk if they were to come in contact with somebody that had COVID, you know, in the short term after surgery, four weeks, uh, that they would be more susceptible to catching it than had they not recently been intubated for surgery. And, and if they did catch it, there'd be a 40% chance that they could be on a ventilator and, and 20% of those people uh, showed a more, uh, were, there was mortality in 20% of those people that went on the ventilator that never came off of it. But right. again, this is still very, very, very limited data that came in the first few weeks of the patients in New York. And it, it really needs more study. Um, you know, for that, for that reason, we've, we've been pretty conservative with it. And, uh, um, and there's, there are, there, when people have to go to the operating room, we have designated COVID rooms that are not used for elective surgery. So lots and lots of precautions are being taken and, and people are doing very well. But certainly something to consider. I mean, if you're an elderly patient, which a lot of knee replacements are and, and hip replacements, and, and depending upon your overall health, if your knee's not bothering you that bad, then maybe it is something that you want to wait on. Um, the problem is, is we just don't know how long this is going to, is going to go on. So um, it want you, you could change your mind at any time. And, and as we learn more about it, then we'll be able to make more and more recommendations. But it is considered to be very safe. We haven't seen a single case of anybody coming down with COVID or having any complications from it since we started up with the knee replacement and hip replacement again. All right, thank you, Dr. McDermott. We have about 30 more questions, so I'm gonna ask you to shorten them up, the answers a little bit. Um, so the next uh, question is, I've been taking a probiotic with uh, Bifobacterium infantis, supposedly good for joints. Are you familiar with this? Uh, I'm familiar with some probiotics. I don't, not that one in particular. Um, you know, again, you'd have to look at it and, and I'd have to pull out the, the package insert and find out what they had in there and why that was supposedly good for joints. But, you know, remember, there's a lot of things they say are good for joints and it, 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 it sells well, but the scientific data often terms is lacking. So you really look at that from the standpoint of what's the harm in taking it other than maybe cost. And if there's no side effects, give it a try. If it works for you, great. Great. Next question is, is Kevlar artificial cartilage available? Um, that's not really at a point yet where it's universally available. And, and uh, again, you're going to have a real hard time getting insurance companies to cover that one. All right. Thank you. The next question is, have you ever experienced blisters on the incision weeks after surgery? Well, you certainly can. Um, again, it, there's a lot of things that you need to do to prevent that. Some Find out, number one, does anybody have any allergies to adhesives? And if you're putting adhesive dressings on there, that's usually what causes blistering most often. You can also get it. It depends on your technique and how well you control your bleeding after surgery because um, this is why sometimes I say that the, the, the length of the surgery is sort of less important than the quality of the surgery. Take a little bit more time to control your bleeding on the way out um, and, and make sure that the knee is dry. If you get a lot of bleeding in there, it leads to a lot of swelling. That's going to cause tissue edema, and that will lead to blisters. And of course, the problem with that is now you've broken down your skin barrier and you're more susceptible to picking up an infection. So... Uh, good closure techniques. I do a multi-layer closure. Most of the time when I take my dressings off the next day, they're bone dry. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question is, will I be able to kneel on my knee after knee replacement? So you certainly can. It's not recommended and patients usually figure that out on their own. And the reason I say that is because Remember, your cartilage is gone. You no longer have any cushion or shock absorber. For the same reason why it's not comfortable to run on it, you now put a plastic button on the back of your, your kneecap, which is bone. And now that's, you're kneeling on that and it's coming in contact with metal on the other side and there's absolutely no give. So in most cases, it really feels like you're kneeling on a rock. And it also, if you take any item, this plastic and you put a piece of metal against it and rub it on that, 
no matter how polished it is, over time it, it tends to damage the plastic and you really don't want to do that to a knee that you want to have last for 25 or 30 years. So that's one of those areas where we really tell people to like, you know, try not to kneel on your new knees, whether it's painful or not. Great, thank you. The next question is, I hurt my knee in 1975 by a fall on a bent leg, recovered, but the back of the knee feels lax and created a popliteal cyst. Never had much swelling, but now feels full. Had meniscus surgery in 1999, which did not do much. I'm an active senior. When do you repair a posterior cruciate ligament? Uh, usually with younger patients, um, I guess. And not, that's not the only indication, but the, the, I mean, if you're already an active senior and if your problem isn't instability, then again, it's one of those where it'd be nice to sit down and, and discuss that one in person with a little bit more information, even though you've given quite a bit. Um, people can function well with a posterior cruciate ligament rupture, whereas an anterior cruciate ligament rupture in most cases have to be reconstructed. I do do posterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Um, it's amazing how many people can function without it. Um, it can lead to arthritis in the knee because of the abnormal motion, um, but and it can also lead to meniscal tears. But I would imagine if this has been in that knee for that amount of time that there's probably also arthritic changes in that knee or degenerative changes in the cartilage. Um, and it's, pro it's probably a situation where the knee replacement is the, is the more appropriate option because that will correct both the meniscal tears uh, and the cartilage damage as well as the posterior ligament rupture. Um, but that's something we could discuss. Okay, next question is, what daily dosage of turmeric do you recommend? Uh, you, 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 what you want to do is just pick that up at the local pharmacy and then, and then just kind of start with the low dose. And, and again, uh, you just kind of want to be cautious about increasing it. If it's working, it's working. If it's not, if you have to keep going up on the dose, then it's maybe time to try something else. All right, thank you. The next question is, aside from Sutter, are, they, are there any other Sonoma County hospitals doing the same day discharge to home after total knee arthroscopy? I have treated one patient of Dr. Howe's that was an AM surgery with a 7 p.m. discharge to home this past January at Sutter. Yeah, I mean, the, it's really, it, all the things we talked about in terms of the, the anesthesia, the post-op care, the nursing care and stuff contribute to it in terms of when the patient goes home. And it, and it also has to do with the surgeon's comfort level and, and how the, and the patient's age and how well they're doing. And, and that happens at Memorial too. And, and I, I'm, I'm not doing any replacements at Healdsburg, but again, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's really surgeon dependent. Both Memorial and Sutter have these programs and that's what's so good about it, that it gets us all on the same page from all elements, the post-op rehabilitation team, as well as the surgeons. And, and that's what really gets people out the door, you know, safely. All right, our next question is, after sitting for a short amount of time, 15 minutes, when I get up, my right hip has an ache, and after a few minutes of walking, all is well. Is this a sign I should see a doctor? Yeah, that's, that's classic arthritis. It, it's, it's, uh, it could be other things, but but that's what arthritis does. It, it likes motion, it doesn't like immobility, but then it reaches a point where too much motion uh, becomes symptomatic and that's usually when you have to do something else. But that's what happens. It, it, and it's amazing how bad the arthritis can get before people start having symptoms or complain about it because the process is so gradual um, that traumatic situations, people that have actually had arthritis from traumatic situations tend to tolerate it less than those that had uh, just degenerative arthritis, but that's what's describing. Initially, it does actually feel better to loosen up the joint and get it lubricated. And I would go see a doctor about it and, and get x-rays so it can be quantitated and then talk about a long range plan while there's still more options. Great. Next question is, I have lots of knee pain walking downstairs. No problem going up or easy walking. Any idea of what could be going on? Uh, well, with that limited information, a whole host of things. It, it, it could be a meniscal tear. Uh, it could be 
uh, patellar tendonitis, it could be uh, you know, arthritis of the knee, but it is typical that, that usually going downstairs is more difficult than going up. And you would think that, that it's harder going up because of the push off, but, but it's the, the need to decelerate the knee when you're stepping down without it giving way tends to make going down more difficult. But I, I really couldn't put a diagnosis on that without more information, x-rays, and an examination. Great. Next question is, is general anesthesia okay for patients that have recovered from a stroke? That's a really good question. And um, in some cases, yes. Um, but it, it is something that is, if, if regional anesthetics and local anesthetics can be done, it's, it's better. Um, so again, that really depends on the, how bad the stroke was. And, and now you're getting into the anesthesiologist's kitchen and, it, and that's kind of one of those things where we definitely talk about those things and it's not that, that it can't be done, but I will then usually get a hold of the anesthesiologist and see if they want to do a consultation on that patient before the surgery to, and, and it's their, it becomes their kitchen to decide what's most appropriate. Great. Thank you. Next question is, can I ride a mountain bike before and after knee replacement as long as it does not hurt? Yes. Yeah. Right. Again, it's, it's, it's a little bit more pounding. Uh, and, uh, but again, it's, it's low impact and it's lubricating. You know, you, you need to decide how aggressive you want to ride because remember, if you get thrown from the bike, this is when you start getting into situations where you could have a fracture and it oftentimes will occur around that prosthesis. And, and so that becomes a more difficult situation in terms of you're trying to repair a fracture and deciding whether you need to remove the previous joint co components and then put them back in with plates or rods and things like that. So, so Riding too aggressively on trails that you're unfamiliar with may not be such a good idea, but there's no problem riding a mountain bike. All right, thank you. Next question is, will visco supplementation increase infection with knee replacement? Uh, it, hard to say from the, let's talk about it. You're probably, the data is mostly on cortisone injections because what cortisone does is it reduces an inflammatory response or it, it and, and an inflammatory response is exactly how your body fights infection. So you're compromising the body's ability to fight an infection. But just the act of introducing a needle into the knee, the knee is a sterile environment. And even though we clean the knee with, with uh, chlorhexidine preparations or betadine and, and the needles are all sterile, it's probably not completely sterile, but the amount of bacteria that gets introduced with each injection is, is minuscule. But if that becomes additive based on the number of injections that you've had, when we talk about limiting the number of injections you've had before surgery, we do throw the visco supplement injections in there. We're certainly a little bit more cautious when, when, when more of them have been cortisone, but it usually gets to a point where those are just no longer effective anymore and the patient is more than ready to move on to knee replacement. Great. Next question is, my bike seat was lowered, causing my leg to be bent too much when riding. My knee doesn't hurt at all, except for when going upstairs or uphill. It never swelled or became inflamed. What could this be? <laughs> uh, well, raise the seat height for one. You could, you, you, you could be onto something where you're simply going into too deep a flexion and that increases the contact stress on the patellofemoral joint. And that can happen in a totally normal knee. Um, you could have, you could have meniscus tears, you could have early arthritis, you know, so, uh, you know, again, all the principles that we've talked about already, you really need to apply those. And, and uh, I think you're already onto something with the knee flexion angle. Um, you know, when you're climbing, you, you want those first 30 degrees of flexion, you don't want to get down to like 60 to 90 degrees. Next question is, why do hips ache so much when we lay down in bed at night? but not getting up. It's so bad sometimes that it wakes me up from a dead sleep. Well, there may be a couple of things going on or one thing or the other. That may be a function of arthritis, but it could be something just like known as, as trochanteric bursitis, where I think you can all reach down and feel the side of your hip and there's a bone there. 
And if you put your hand over that bone and get up from a chair, you can find, you can feel how tightly the band over it puts pressure over that bone. And there's a bursa under that that can get inflamed very commonly, which is usually treated successfully with cortisone and, and physical therapy, one or the other or both. Uh, but you can also do it with arthritis. If you have an arthritic hip and you're laying on that side, you're creating more pressure of the ball up against the socket while you're laying on it. No, and it's, it's like we talked about earlier, where you stay in one position for a long period of time, like driving in a car with a knee or a hip, and it gets stiff. So that extra pressure when you're laying on it will, will cause that much more uh, inflammation and pain sooner and maybe to a greater extent to where it wakes you up. Uh, this is kind of a, another question in the same vein. It says, what if you have hip pain? In it? What if you have pain in the hips that keeps you up at night, been going on for months, and sometimes there is an experience of collapse of the hip, but no diagnosed arthritis? So, so was, when you say no diagnosed arthritis, is that because there was x-rays that were performed and showed no arthritis? Um, if that were the case, then I would look for other sources. Uh, maybe there's a labral tear in there if people are getting popping sensations or even if they're not, that could be causing the pain. Again, it could be trochanteric bursitis. It could be a tendonitis or inflammation of any of the muscles that are surrounding the hip joint. So again, this is very little information to make a diagnosis where not only is more information necessary, but the ability to, to not only also look at x-rays, but examine the body. That's going to give you a lot of information that's going to help you nail that diagnosis down so that, so that accurate recommendations can be made. Next question is, how long before you can use your leg for weight-bearing walking? After, after a hip or knee replacement? I'm assuming that's what it is, but it's not specific here. Um, the day of surgery, we get you up. You know, we don't, we don't want you in bed. You, you can put full weight on these components. They will not fall apart or come out or loosen or dislocate. And, and uh, you, usually patients will tell you that, you know, yeah, I can feel incisional pain or, or, or if it's immediately after surgery while the blocks and things are working, maybe none at all. And, and all their arthritic pain is already gone. So, um, yeah, you get up on them right away. Good. This is an interesting one. Since the relationship between tissue pathology and pain is not good, and many people function well despite pathology with little to no pain, would you consider using interdisciplinary pain management as another conservative treatment method? Say that one again, Sean. Sure. Since the relationship between tissue pathology and pain is not good, and many people function well despite pathology with little to no pain, would you consider using interdisciplinary pain management as another conservative treatment approach? Yeah, I, I mean, certainly they're, they're, I'm not opposed to, to, to alternative medicines and, and things like that. It, 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 again, it, you're describing a patient that's been maybe diagnosed with arthritis but saying they're not having any pain, if I understand that correctly. Um, the you know, it, you just have to apply the treatment to the individual. And, and again, it's a, it's a matter of uh, bringing a patient into the office, having a conversation with them and, and really going through, taking a, a, a thorough, uh, comprehensive history, looking at x-rays and then based on, and then listen to what the patient's saying. Where are my symptoms? What brings them on? Uh, am I having pain? Am I not? What have I done for it? And then you have to take all that information into consideration. How old is that patient? What treatment options are available? You know, again, if they're young and, and, and you know that, that that knee probably won't last 25 or 30 years because maybe they're still working and they're gonna put a higher demand on it and, and uh, you wanna try to put that off as long as possible, um, all that factors into it, but I don't rule out alternative sources of medicine by any way, by any means. I think those can be just as effective. I mean, you're getting into things like acupuncture, certainly. And, and again, I, I've said I'm a very big believer in that. All right, next question is, what do you do for fluid on the knee? My husband has had it removed twice and some cortisone injected. He doesn't have much pain, but his knee filled up with fluid after each draining. So... The fluid is an indication that there is some pathology in that knee. 
probably arthritis, probably possibly a meniscus tear as well. Um, and that's what, you get sand in your eye, your eye waters and produces tears, right? If you get irritation in your knee in the form of cartilage wearing out or becoming degenerative, it will produce reactive fluid. The, and it gets to the point where the knee will swell up so bad that, that it can, if it doesn't cause pain, it can shut your quad down and it can compromise your range of motion, which can then lead to episodes of giving way or pain. And, and uh, so tapping the knee and removing fluid from it is the right thing to do. And following it up with a cortisone injection is to reduce the inflammation to prevent it from coming back. But again, this counts as what a needle that's been in the knee, you know, so you, Every time you introduce a needle in there, you could introduce an infection. I think it's a very reasonable thing to do, and I do it in my practice, to aspirate knees and inject them with cortisone. But if it keeps happening, you really have to explore why is that happening, whether it's an MRI that tells you you have a meniscus tear. At that point, you probably need to do something about the meniscus tear. You know, uh, same thing with the arthritis. I mean, then you start having to look for, the, has physical therapy been done? Uh, is this one of the reasons why maybe uh, it, it's, it, it's, you find out that the arthritis is just so advanced that this may be another reason why they just simply need to have the knee replacement done. Great. Thank you. Next one is a doctor performed my right THR four years ago. Very happy I did. Recently, I have strained lifting something heavy walking up steps. Can ligaments slash ten tendons get strained? Sure they can. Yeah, it, the same way they could before the hip was replaced. Um, so, it, it, again, you know, even conditioned athletes, if they're out of shape for a while and they don't condition and they go back to their sport, then they're more susceptible to injuring muscles and tendons at the attachment as well as at the musculotendinous junction. And what are we dealing with in a situation with a hip replacement? Well, usually somebody's activity level uh, became more and more compromised until they finally had the hip replaced, but at the same time, they were less active. So those muscles got out of shape. That's why preoperative physical therapy, whether it's a knee or a hip is very, very important and can pay dividends from the standpoint of restoring that strength after the, before the surgery to pay dividends afterward. But, but absolutely uh, that can make people more susceptible to, to muscle strains and tendon, tendonitis. Thank you. Next question is, after an ORIF surgery, is it common to experience pain in ad adductor muscles such that it prohibits weight bearing on that leg? Um, that's another one that's a little bit difficult to answer. Your pain can be coming from a number of sources, uh, injury to the muscle. Maybe it's the hardware that's in place that, that uh, is causing it. But oftentimes, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it it can be that for a period of time after a fracture like that, you know, we try to get you up as quickly as possible and get you moving again, but muscles get weaker far quicker than they get strong again. And, and uh, so it, it could simply represent a strain. That's one where I would, uh, you know, have to look at the x-rays and, and take a look is, is the hardware in a position where it could be causing irritation or is this simply a matter of, of just needing some, get somebody in some good physical therapy and work it out, strengthen it. Great. Next question is, I had a knee replacement a year ago. One of the complications I had was I got a pinched nerve in my lower back, either during or after the surgery, and had a lot of nerve pain in my leg. Is there a way to avoid this because I'm going to need to have my other knee done? Well, my recommendation would be that before doing the knee, that the back be worked up thoroughly uh, with x-rays, physical examination. Um, it pro the nerve probably didn't get pinched just by the positioning. There's probably some degenerative changes in that lower back that got inflamed or aggravated as a result of the surgery, whether it was from being asleep on a table for an hour to three hours or uh, leaning over, utilizing a walker after the surgery, uh, bad posture, uh, increased back strength, that type of thing. Um, and, and in those cases, oftentimes I will treat the back first, you know, depending upon the extent of, of uh, degenerative changes there and kind of deceive, decide which one's the bigger problem. You might want to send somebody for selected facet joint injections or epidural steroid injections and things like that and physical therapy for back strengthening and rehabilitation to get the back optimized before approaching the knee. So it really, it's a coordinated effort. 
Okay, next question is, if you need a knee replacement and then lose weight, could it possibly reverse the need for the replacement? Yeah, absolutely it can. I, I've seen it often. The, that's the biggest thing is, is, you know, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery came out and said, anybody whose body mass index is above 35 should be considered a relative contraindication to knee replacement and over 40 should be considered for possibly to be an absolute contraindication until the weight comes down. And there's a number of reasons for that because there's usually a bigger soft tissue envelope that can produce rolls in the skin that, that can trap bacteria near the incision after the surgery and lead to infection. But also just trying to carry that weight around when you already have muscles that have lost strength can lead to increased falls and, and things like that. But you get into that one equals five uh, formula again. And I've seen a number of patients that uh, some people, you know, this is not just, uh, uh, I think people are cruel to people that are overweight and they think that it's all behavioral and, and relative to overeating, but a lot of times it is metabolic. And so sometimes the surgical options become a consideration and you see people drop 50 pounds and they'll come back and tell you, my knee doesn't hurt anymore. I'll come back and see you when it does. All right. Next question was, uh, what's your experience with cannabis oil? Does it work? Question mark. Uh, I see an awful lot of patients coming into clinic that swear by it. So, uh, you know, it's something that so far there, I haven't seen anything in the literature or, or otherwise that, that has shown any adverse properties or uh, with using it. It's a topical, it's over the counter. And, and uh, um, I've seen a lot of patients, particularly with soft tissue stuff and in arthritic cases that, that uh, really swear that it helps a tremendous amount. Great, just a couple more questions. Uh, next one is, can a nerve issue in the foot happen because of a meniscus tear? Can a nerve issue in the foot happen because of a meniscus tear? Um, I would say probably not. Okay. Unless you're, again, unless that meniscus tear was causing pain in the knee, which was causing somebody to walk differently to where they were placing weight on the foot in a manner that was out of balance with their anatomy, then yeah, it could certainly do that. Great, next question is, when can you drive again and resume normal activities after a knee replacement? <laughs> this is the great question. So, so the legal answer from all my attorney friends is to, as a physician, to never give someone permission to drive after surgery because if they get in an accident, then the attorneys will want to go after the, the surgeon that gave them permission to. Um, the rule of thumb is this. You can drive when you can safely control your vehicle in an emergency situation. If a young child ran out in front of your car and you had knee surgery on your right knee, and the minute you stamped on the brake pedal, you had pain that was severe enough to cause you to reflexively pull your foot off the brake, then you should not have been behind the wheel. If you're under the influence of any post-operative pain medication, you should not be driving. But you, know, you could make an argument that if somebody you know, had surgery on the left leg and you're driving an automatic and you can control that vehicle just fine, uh, you know, that's a decision that you sort of have to make on your own. There's no law against it, but, but there can be liability issues. The other thing you have to consider too is, you know, we don't recommend after surgery like that, taking any long trips in the car anyway, because you're increasing your, your blood clot risk and potential for getting a DVT, you know? So, so um, have that conversation with your physician and they'll kind of give you guidance on it, but they probably won't give you permission. Very good. Um, next question is when you speak of a needle, introducing infection is it apparent immediately or something that is latent and flares up at a different time if so what period of time and in general would this be problematic yeah it, it most people you're not going to see an infection in the clinic right after you do the injection it, it's uh and again this is something that is very 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 uncommon and and uh i'm simply saying that usually what the literature is discussing and what we talked about was that the number of injections that have been performed prior to the knee replacement 
can increase the risk of a post-operative infection. And, and it's, it's multifactorial. It's how often did you inhibit the body's ability to form an inflammatory response to fight infection with multiple cortisone injections? Uh, and, and is any bacteria, even a microscopic amount, introduced with each injection? Not enough to cause an infection in a knee, but maybe enough when you put inert objects like metal and plastic into a knee that don't have a blood supply and if bacteria sticks to that your body can't fight it so next question is uh collagen is it helpful in the supplemental form it's another one where it's very anecdotal it, it, you're again you're not going to grow new cartilage or, or anything like that it's it's uh it's a matter of can it strengthen it and and uh so it, there's you look at the, 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 the interplay between, does it, is there any downside to it versus is there potentially upside? And if it works for you, great. Great, last two questions. Um, can a person run or hike after knee replacement surgery? Well, I think we already touched on the running part. It's really discouraged. Um, and, and I have seen patients in my practice do it and did well for about three months after surgery. And then all of a sudden they were having pain and swelling in their knee. And, and I asked them if they'd started running again. The answer was no, but then the physical therapist said, well, yeah, they told me they are. And, and, uh, and that knee has since been replaced. So um, you really shouldn't run on knee replacements. And, and what was the other part of that, Sean? Run or hike. Oh yeah. Hiking you can do, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend that you try to go do Shiloh, but, but, you know, again, hikes that are maybe a little bit harder, the terrain is steep and maybe not as solid and where you're really coming down with each step and pounding on it, that may not be such a good idea, but, but there's a lot of people that have their knee replacements because that's exactly what they want to get back to doing and, and there's no problem. Great. This is the, looks like the last question for now. Um, are you accepting new patients? And if so, do I need a referral from a primary care doctor? The answer is yes, I, I'm, I'm definitely accepting new patients. And uh, if you're Medicare, you do not need a referral. Some of your insurances uh, don't need referral. You kind of have to talk to your insurance carrier and ask them whether you, your insurance requires a referral or not. Most of the HMOs you will need a referral from your primary care provider and most of the PPOs you do not. Great. Um, so I think that concludes what we've got. Thank you, Dr. McDermott.